So currently, the indications for hot spexis that uh, include many clinical conditions. So traditionally, we would use these metal stents for drainage of pancreatic fluid collections, like the pseudocyst, as well as water pancreatic necrosis. Uh, recently, we are also extending the indications. Uh, for example, we are draining the bowel ducts, the gallbladders, or even we are now performing gastroenterostomies or gastrogastrostomies. So um, apart from draining uh, different organs, we are using, also using these stents as a portal of uh, allowing the endoscope to go from uh, one area to another area previously not accessible by endoscopy. So um, these indications are really expanding and expanding. And as to the number of patients that may benefit from these procedures, I think uh, there are so many of these patients uh, that, are, that can uh, potentially benefit. For example, in water necrosis, um, traditionally these procedures are performed by surgical uh, drainage followed by necrosectomy. But nowadays we can uh, perform all these procedures with endoscopic drainage followed by endoscopic necrosectomy. Uh, on the ERCP biliary drainage arm, uh, we are also uh, examining the uh, possibility of performing USBD as an alternative to ERCP. Uh, in terms of gallbladder drainage, um, uh, we have published a trial comparing US gallbladder drainage with percutaneous gallbladder, gallbladder drainage, again showing uh, many significant uh, advantages. And now we also examine the opportunity to perform this procedure for surgical candidates as well. So for me, I think the indications are ever expanding and the number of patients that can benefit from, from these procedures will be a lot. So as with any new devices, definitely there's a learning curve associated with uh, these procedures. Um, for us, we sort of learn it from our experience. So um, really, we have to experiment and uh, try uh, different ways uh, and to see which way is the best way of performing these procedures. But for my juniors, uh, um, they have the benefit from learning our mistakes, from our mistakes. So um, for them, the learning experience is much better. And to have this a uh, single step device uh, also allows them to mix the entire procedure a lot more easier. Um, you don't need to exchange devices. You don't need to worry about things um, not going inside to the organ. So um, I think uh, for them, it's definitely uh, much more beneficial. Uh, in terms of um, some uh, any um, interesting cases, I think there are many interesting cases. Uh, for me, I'm a gallbladder person, so I do a lot of gallbladder drainages. Um, so when the hot spexes uh, first came out, I did the first few patients um, uh, with a direct puncture. Um, and on first experience, the hot spexes um, went into the gallbladder very easily. And also um, the delivery system is sort of moved. When we deploy it, it's sort of a conformed, conformed to the uh, shape of the gallbladder. So it wasn't so stiff that it would push the gallbladder away. So I think it's overall, it's a very nice device to use. So um, for tubular stents, um, there are some indications uh, which uh, tubular stent may be better uh, versus a hot spexis stent may be better. So I think for particular for conditions where we think about uh, uh, a transluminal intervention, for example, in endoscopic necrosectomy or in gallbladder drainage where you may want to uh, clear the gallstones or in some gastroenterostomy where you want to insert a scope through the stent to get to whatever you want to go to. So these are particular uh, good uh, clinical situations that is suitable for hot spex stent. Because um, the stent has anti-migratory uh, flanges at the end, so it can anchor the two lumens together quite well. But at the same time, the stent is very short, so the scope can go through the stent quite easily. So if it's a long tubular stent, sometimes the scope cannot go through the stent. And also the tubular stent in general, the diameter is um, uh, maximum is one centimeter. So you can only insert a 5.5 milli millimeter ultra thin endoscope into the stent. So um, the number of accessories that can, you can use with a small size scope is uh, limited. So um, definitely um, in conditions where you expect to have further intervention when you go through the scent are, are good indications.
So for pancreatic fluid collections is quite a big topic. Mm -hmm. So actually, um, drainage is only a one part of the procedure. So we really need to see the patient as a whole. Uh, first, uh, starting from indications, uh, whether they are indicated to drain or not. Um, the type of fluid collection, pseudocyst versus uh, wall of necrosis. So definitely, um, if pseudocysts, they tend to be uh, easier to manage uh, clinically. And usually after drainage, they tend to uh, resolve uh, after a period of time. Whereas for wall of necrosis, um, drainage is only part of the procedure. Uh, sometimes these patients are very ill. Uh, they can be in the intensive care unit. And after drainage, you might need to uh, provide additional supports like irrigation or even necrosectomy. So um, choosing your, the right patient for your procedure is definitely very important. Uh, if you are just starting to do the procedure, I would suggest you to start with some patients that are um, clinically more stable, uh, easier to manage as opposed to those very ill. Uh, and also um, those patients with a very early collections um, where the wall is not well formed. Um, so you need, really need to choose the patients uh, to have a good clinical outcome. So after you choose the right patients, then you can start to think about how to drain it. There yeah, are various ways of draining the collection, um, like by EOS or percutaneous or even by surgery. So um, usually we would suggest uh, a multidisciplinary meeting to have a talk with your interventional radiologists as well as surgeons as to the best method for drainage. And if everyone can come to a consensus that EUS guider is the best approach, then uh, you have the support of all your colleagues, then uh, it is a good uh, situation for you to perform the drainage. Um, when you start performing these procedures, um, uh, most of the drainage procedures can be divided into four simple steps. First is to puncture with a needle, followed by guide wire insertion, and then dilatation of the track, and then send in deployment. So if you are just uh, starting this procedure very early, uh, then I would not suggest you to perform a direct puncture because um, uh, sometimes the direct puncture, you need to be very familiar with the devices. Uh, although it's very safe and easy to perform, but um, because uh, after direct puncture, you don't have a guide wire to save you. So if something goes wrong, or uh, if you misdeploy the stent, uh, then uh, you will be in a very difficult situation. So for those uh, uh, starting to perform the procedure, I usually suggest you to perform a puncture with a 19 gauge needle first, followed by guide wire insertion, and then insertion the, of the hot spexis device. So with the hot spexis device, you can still avoid the need for um, uh, dilatation of the track with different devices like the cystotomin balloon, and you can just uh, direct uh, puncture directly with the hot um, cautery enhanced uh, delivery system, followed by stand insertion. Uh, uh, so, um, in this way, uh, you still have the guide wire in situ and after deployment of the uh, metal stent, uh, if you also want to insert additional plastic stents as well, you can use the same guide wire to insert the plastic stent. And uh, also, because, because uh, the hot uh, delivery system is a very conventional system, so um, your nurses will be very familiar with the way the stand is being deployed. But for, for the endoscopist, uh, usually the distal flange, I would suggest you to deploy under ultrasound guidance. After you deploy the distal flange, you pull back the stand and then deploy the proximal flange in the endoscopic uh, the endoscope channel. So in this way, if the stand is in the channel, then you slowly push it out, then it's a very controlled uh, deployment of the proximal uh, flange. Um, and I think this is the suggested way of performing a years guided uh, stenting nowadays for most of these um, uh, dumbbell shaped stent. Again, I also suggest you to use a needle followed by guide wire insertion. Um, the gut bladder in general is not as dilated as like the gallbladder or the water necrosis. So um, usually if you do a direct puncture, sometimes it can be difficult to maneuver the delivery system up the bowel duct. So um, in this situation, I usually, usually suggest you to have a needle followed by wire, wire insertion uh, and then the stand insertion. And in the bowel duct, you need to be careful because the flange, uh, distal flange of the spexis needs to uh, uh, fold upon itself for complete deployment. So sometimes the duct may not be uh, enough dilated enough. So you need to be careful when you open the stand, you need to make sure it has enough space to uh, completely uh, back fold uh, onto the stand itself. Uh, because if the duct is too small, sometimes the stand cannot um, 
uh, fall back on itself and it, uh, that may become a problem um, because the stand is not completely open it may be obstructing the bow duct as well and as to the proximal flange again is usually deployed inside the channel for the gallbladder it's very similar to the wall of necrosis um, so um, if you are not familiar i suggest you to use a needle first if you are familiar with the procedure then you can start with the direct puncture